I'm Susan Nash, AAPG, and you are watching our Science and Technology Showcase. I'm happy to introduce our guest today, Dave Tonner. He's a um, hybrid, he's going to talk about hybrid mud logging, and he's with Diversified Well Logging. Welcome, David. Good afternoon, Susan. Thank you. So, how did you get interested in mud logging? Well, I, uh, I studied geology at uh, Nottingham University, and uh, I had a really inspirational high school teacher, uh, Keith Hamilton, who had the most wonderful rock and mineral collection. And uh, he was the person that got me interested in, in geology. And, uh, and that led to my uh, first job uh, working in mud logging, uh, which happened to be in uh, Kenya uh, for Amoco on the, uh, on the border with uh, Ethiopia in the Chalbi Desert. Uh, they were drilling a 27,000 foot exploration well <laughs> into, wow. into some Devonian orthoquartzites, which was a, it was a, it was a very exciting initiation to my, uh, to, to my rig career. So. That sounds like a, a bit chewer. <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> anyway, well, tell us about hybrid mud logging. Yeah, look, so, um, you, you know, mud logging has, hasn't really changed much uh, in terms of rock collection uh, and analysis, really since spindle tops, you know, buckets and trowels and, and uh, people looking down microscopes and making visual estimations of, of what is in the rock. And there's some really good mud loggers, by the way, and it's a very noble profession. However, it is a little subjective and qualitative, and it varies from person to person, day shift to night shift, well to well. And so it makes it difficult to be used as a, as a correlation tool and to be able to bring it into a workflow where petrophysicists petro can upscale it to seismic and really make sense of the data. Uh, and so what we've done is we've started to automate some of the processes and step one is quite simply deploying a portable benchtop XRF, as you can see over here. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, and so that uh, gives us uh, up to 42 elements and uh, both major oxides and trace elements. And we can generate things like a, a gamma ray, uh, which you can see over here in, on this curve, where the red curve is uh, simply by adding uranium, potassium, and thorium, uh, the gamma ray of the rock that we're actually measuring. And we can compare that to the MWD gamma ray in green. And so we know that the rocks are actually coming from the depth that we think that they're coming from. So that's, that's, that's the first phase. Nice. And then the next step is that, you know, from that we can generate a, a model mineralogy. Uh, we can make estimations of mechanical strength. Uh, we can get indication of uh, clay typing. Um, so is it, uh, you know, we, do we have uh, glauconites? Do we have illites? Uh, do we have mixed uh, layer clay smectites? Um, we can get indication of reservoir quality using things like silica over aluminum. Uh, and we can uh, measure uh, matrix grain density and estimate bulk density. And so it's a data set that really grows a lot of lags and provides a window into the subsurface that, you know, we really haven't been able to see on a regular basis before. And, you know, some of the things that we're then doing is applying data science, like uh, in this particular example, a random forest data science approach allows us to define formation tops based on the elemental composition. So a step further in taking the subjectivity of what somebody thinks is in the rock and replacing it with something much more quantitative and, and much more scientific. And so, so you know that, can, yes. So you can build in uncertainty into your model with that. Exactly, yes. Uh, and so with that, you know, we can start to uh, do things like geosteering and uh, we can do it both manually in step one and actually move to full automation in step two. Um, we start to then also be able to impact drilling efficiency. So we can look at the unconfined compressive strength uh, estimated of the rock uh, 
uh, i.e. what force is required to break the rock, as you can see here in this blue curve, versus the actual mechanical specific energy being delivered by the drill bit. So it really is a, a marriage of uh, uh, geology and drilling, <laughs> uh, which is uh, um, often uh, sometimes there's some friction in those relationships, but the, the ability to provide the data in a way that the drilling engineer can consume and use makes it a lot more practical. Um, and, and the same on the completion side. So we follow in the same workflows and processes where we go from elements to minerals, to hardness, to unconfined compressive strength. Uh, we can also deliver that information in a way that a completions engineer can utilize and optimize completion design for maximum performance. Oh, that's very impressive. Yeah, and, and it really, and then the next step is to actually then go into production forecasting. And so, you know, we can take the whole, the whole uh, reservoir, we can input uh, your major information required in terms of uh, pressures, permeability, temperatures, um, offset well data, actual production information. And we can start to then see what moves the needle in terms of uh, improved productivity, whether it's um, uh, stage spacing, um, clusters, number of perforations, and then also put in the actual rock data to see how that is impacting both the uh, daily flow and cumulative flow and EUR to be able to make your the best decision. So it's very much about breaking down silos between disciplines and uh, uh, and, and making a very fast and nimble process so that uh, you know, reservoir managers, engineers, asset managers can make better economic decisions. Oh, that's great. So it looks like you're using AI for not only classification and identification, but also for prediction. Absolutely, yes. And, and that, that obviously plays a part as well into drilling optimization where um, we can start to uh, do much more analysis of which particular benches, for example, might have higher rates of penetration or less drilling dysfunction or less downhole tool uh, failure and, um, and link those processes together. Oh, that's great. And then, you know, one of the things that we've, uh, we've been focusing on, and we're fortunate to have a rich history in deep water, but we've actually started to use uh, an, an integrated approach to uh, chemostratigraphy or the use of XRF elements and biostratigraphy micropaleontology oh, wow. to build up a very comprehensive picture of um, uh, compaction, rates of sedimentation, seal qualities, and how that relates to wellbore construction. For example, are we seeing... Uh, more hole instability? Are we seeing increases in pressure? And, and it's, it, the hole stability issues, pore pressure, geomechanical related problems, you know, are at least a billion dollar MPT problem to Deepwater Gulf of Mexico annually, uh, according to um, information, publicly available information. So it's a, it's a significant problem. And, you know, we down on this bottom chart here is actually an example of what we're doing in uh, offshore in Mexico, where we're actually using a combination of biostratigraphy and chemostratigraphy to pick the tertiary Cretaceous boundary uh, with the objective of, of seeding the casing at that point, because there's a huge pressure regression from 16 pounds per gallon down to six. And so picking that uh, point for casing is is pivotal to the to the economics of the project. Oh my goodness, yes. Mm. Well, I'm also thinking that with this integrated approach, it could definitely help with um, reservoir connectivity in the case of turbidites, things like that. Absolutely, yeah. You know, you uh, combining the mud gas data, you know, C1 to C5, mass spectrometry up to C10, aromatics, inerts, uh, nitrogen, CO2, hydrogen, helium, you can start to understand compartmentalization, connectivity, uh, and, and look at that both within the well as well as across the field. 
And, uh, you know, that's also a major um, issue in deep water turbidites. Absolutely. Wow. This is great. Yeah. And then, you know, the other aspect that we've been working on is also uh, using uh, digital microscopy and image recognition software to, again, give quantitative estimations of uh, color, uh, morphology, um, and that includes obviously the size, the shape, and we can start to look at things like angularity, sphericity, uh, el elongatedness. So the things that you would normally tie into wellbore stability, i.e. in an abnormally pressured shale where you would see concave, convex, elongate um, cavings, uh, we can start to apply uh, AI and uh, image software recognition to, again, take away the subjectivity, make it faster, uh, more reliable, and then immediately build that into a model to understand what, what are the implications in terms of, do I need to increase mud weight, decrease mud weight, apply more back pressure um, in order to maintain wellbore stability. So, you know, there's a lot of people doing AI it seems it's, it's sort of like, you know, the buzzword of the day and it's okay. all very, it's all very fashionable, but um, you know, my experience has been that it's really about the practical application and mm -hmm. having the right sort of subject matter experts and data scientists together in a small team like ours allows us to act very quickly and nimbly. And we, we know exactly what we're trying to get to. And so, you know, we're not spending a lot of time on, you know, what if scenarios, we, we understand the use cases, we understand the problems, and that allows us to get to, uh, you know, to the use cases and, and value to our customers a lot faster. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, but we're not stopping there. Like, what's actually really exciting is, we, you know, we truly believe that the future's automated and it's, and it's going to be about the, you know, automation of, um, of services and um, analysis of, of, of cuttings and, and other things. And then, and delivering a, a RAS or robotics as a service, which mm -hmm. is what, which is what we uh, I love that. are looking to do with our robo logger. Right. So we, right. we actually have a machine that can collect samples uh, automatically uh, every uh, two minutes. So very fast. So mm -hmm. even at high rates of penetration, you can get very good depth resolution. And the next phase, which we're actually working with Shell Game Changer on, is incorporating a LIBS laser. And you can see it's the same sort of lasers that are on the Mars uh, rover uh, project with NASA. And we're getting, again, up to 42 elements um, and um, minerals. And so we're able to um, create a very high resolution window into the subsurface, as you can see, from this chart here where we were actually comparing the robo logger collected samples and analyzed with XRF to the uh, green curves, which are uh, the core, uh, which were analyzed by the Van Gotten Laboratory litho scanner. Uh, and so um, this is, it's, it's a really interesting uh, breakthrough. Uh, the next phase is to fully automate the ele elements and minerals, which is the inclusion of the LIBS laser and we're looking to have field deployments of that device in uh, late Q2 of this year. So, um, wow. Well, you know, if you had the pivot away from the oil industry, I can see how the Revo log logger and robotics as a service, you could use this in construction for integrity um, when it's based on, on the materials. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there's also applications in mining in some of the rare earth uh, elements and, and metals, for example, for use oh, in, right. in, in batteries for electric cars. Um, and, and in fact, you know, if we, if we replaced our current fleet of 100 mud logging units um, with robo logger, just the reduction in movement of people would save about 10,000 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent uh, annually. So it's, it's also good for the environment. That's wonderful. That's incredible. <laughs> and uh, yes, so that's, I mean, those are, those are the things that we're, um, you know, we've been working on and, uh, 
uh, really appre appreciate the the opportunity that you've given to us to to talk about it with the uh, with the AEPG. Oh, well, we really appreciate it. It's it's impressive to see what you're doing, and I think important for people to have the opportunity to to be inspired and 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 have an idea of how how far you've taken this. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. Very much appreciated. No problem. Well, thank you again. And for everyone who's watching, we've been having a wonderful conversation with Dave Tonner, and he's with Diversified Well Logging. And we're looking forward to reading the, the written interview as well. So thank you. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Well, I hope that the airplane going ahead, I have my door open because it's such a nice day, but of course there's no plane traffic and now just when I'm recording. <laughs> okay, so is that, is that good? You did great, yeah. So I'll, I'll, um, it'll take me a while to process it, but you did a great job and I'll, I'll put it and I've got your written interview, so I'll send that in and the images. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Susan. I appreciate it very much. Great. Well, okay. Okay, have a nice afternoon. Thanks, bye. Bye. bye.